So here's a look at oil, crude oil, petroleum, which is a sludge-like mix of hundreds of types of hydrocarbon molecules formed from temperature and heat over time. It's found one to two miles below ground, and oil refineries sort the various hydrocarbons of crude oil, separating those to be used in gasoline with those used for other purposes like tar, asphalt, etc. The history is that it was first used about 4,000 years ago in the form of surface tar or asphalt. We even have some mines here at UCSB. They're asphalt mines because of the natural oil seepage. And modern extraction began in the 1850s in Pennsylvania. And today, oil is the world's most used fuel. It's very convenient. And you can see here that um, most of the world's production occurs in Saudi Arabia and most of the world's consumption occurs in the United States. How we drill for it? Well, we often will tap into the ocean floor and you can see that there's oil and pores of rocks and above it we have this impermeable layer of rock. So we basically drill a hole and uh, begin to pump it out. We call primary extraction the initial extraction which just uses air pressure but when we do secondary extraction, we have to force the oil out by pumping water or gas into rock to displace it. So let me say something else about this primary extraction. You've seen the pumps, they're called horseshoe pumps. They're kind of rocking back and forth. And those are using the air pressure. So very much like a water pump you may have used before. Um, but then if once we get all that, in order to get the remaining part, we have to inject it with seawater. And injecting the water forces the oil up and out. So it's a case of the low hanging fruits very easy to get to, but when you start to get when you start trying to get the rest of what's in that reserve, then it gets pretty tricky. So um, this is kind of what we just talked about. You can summarize, pause, and summarize if you want. We use petroleum for an incredibly diverse amount of products. Anything that's plastic, anything that um, obviously for our gasoline. Um, the roads you can see have asphalt in them. Your house most likely has asphalt shingles. Um, that's the most common roofing material. And how we get these different components from the crude oil is through a process called distillation. So we have the crude oil comes in, first it's warmed up to make it more uh, fluid, and then it goes in here and we heat it up and the parts that evaporate more easily go higher up. So butane is one part that it, that evaporates extremely easily, which is one reason why it's good to use in lighters, because um, it evaporates quickly. So it quickly comes out as a gas, and then you can light it. And here you, you see other components here too, like gasoline, diesel, lubricating oil, that's also called motor oil. And so the, re, the, refining, the refining process can be summarized like so. Okay. On to the next slide. When we look at crude oil, mostly about 44% of it is used for gasoline. 22.4% is used for diesel fuel or heating oil. And then we have jet fuel, heavy oil, heavy fuel oil, and other products. Other products would be like plastics. This idea of peak oil is an idea that we may have already extracted half of the world's oil reserves, about 1 trillion barrels. And um, to try to estimate how long the remaining oil will last, analysts calculate the reserves to production ratio. And they divide the amount of total remaining reserves by the annual rate of production. Basically, um, what they end up with is a curve that looks like this. And this guy, Hubbard, he was a pretty smart guy. Back in the, I guess it was the early, late 50s, early 60s, he predicted that in the 70s, the U.S. would... Um, reach its peak in oil production. And he was totally right. This is what he predicted in red, and this is what ended up actually becoming true. So ever since 1970, or I guess I have to say ever since the mid-80s, the U.S. has been producing less and less oil from our own territory every year, importing more. Okay. And we can look at other countries that have already reached past peak or also have reached past peak. So this is identified the U.S. on here. Here it is, Texas, USA. So that peaked in the 1970s. 
and um, all these ones that you see going up and going down, that means that they reached their peak production. And after that, they had to start importing more. Um, the main ones that haven't yet reached their peak production would be places like Saudi Arabia, um, or perhaps they have, hard to know. So approximately how many barrels of oil is used per day in the U.S.? Go ahead and make your prediction. It is an astonishing 20 million barrels, and less than half are produced in the U.S. Most are from the Middle East. So here we can see kind of a breakdown. Um, the U.S.'s oil consumption has been rising since the early 80s, um, about 20 million. Europe is also very heavy users as is Asia and Oceania. This is the graph showing the oil field discovery. Um, what that means is when geologists can discover that, ah, there must be oil under this location. We can see a lot of the discoveries were um, happening in the mid 1900s. In fact, it peaked around 1960 or so. And after that, for the most part with each passing year, we've discovered less and less oil um, to tap into. Uh, but you can see it's not completely steady. And our rate of production, as you can see also, um, well, that's kind of interesting. You know, I don't think this is the U.S. This is global. Um, so global production has still been increasing, but we're not sure if it's peaked or not. All right, crude oil production and imports. Um, same story, basically. Our production went down in the late 60s. Our imports have gone up. And most of that oil is coming from Saudi Arabia. They are by far the wealthiest country due to oil. They're just saying uh, that a man from Saudi Arabia would say, my grandfather rode a camel, my father drove a car, I ride in a jet airplane, and my children will ride a camel. Because they know that their natural resource is limited but they're trying to transition to other forms of um, of an economy, like trying to um, make themselves perhaps some kind of a um, tourist destination or whatnot, or investing in solar or things like that. So what about the Arctic Refuge? Can we get some more oil out of our own territory? The Arctic Refuge is the area in Alaska that's a wilderness area. And if we tap into it, we would get about 7.7 .7 billion barrels over 50 years. And how long will that last? You can see here the projected U.S. consumption. It's a very small part. It's not going to have much effect on our oil needs. So some people feel like we should wake up. That we are at peak oil. We need to do something to transition away from gasoline. They're saying we are here. The question is, are we here? Hard to know. But most people feel like if we're not there now, we're close. All right, let's take a look at natural gas. It's primarily methane, CH4, and it's produced by anaerobic decomposition of organic matter by bacteria. The key there is anaerobic decomposition. When you have aerobic, what happens is they give off CO2, different type of bacteria. And the history is that seeps have been known for 2,000 or more years. It was used for street lighting in the 1800s, and it became commonly used after World War II once pipeline technology became safer. That is the biggest limitation of of um, natural gas is how to transport it safely without leaks or without explosions. You can see here that the U.S. is the leader in natural gas consumption. Russia is the leader in production. And to extract the gas, initially the gas comes out on its own from natural pressure and later it must be pumped. This is called a horse head pump. So what are some alternative fossil fuel sources? Well, these are fossil fuel sources that are a little bit um, harder to get the fuel out of. Tar sands, also called oil sands, are dense, hard oil substances that can be mined from the ground. Shale oil is sedimentary rock filled with organic matter that was not buried deeply enough to form oil. It's obtained by fracking. And methane hydrates, which occur under the seafloor. Let's take a quick look at those. Here's a picture of tar sand or oil sand mining, very common in Canada. And it's rock or sand that's impregnated with tar or asphalt. 75% of the known reserves are in wetlands of northern Canada. And it's obtained by strip mining the sand and washing the oil out with hot water. 
the hotness makes the oil get um, more fluid. The impacts, big time wetland restoration after mining is difficult. So um, you basically wreck wetland areas and it uses and contaminates a lot of water. So what's another type? So here's the hydraulic fracturing, fracking, which we'll do a little bit more with in class. The removal of natural gas from shale rock by fracturing the rock with high pressure fluids. So here we have um, the, this rock down here, which contains portions of, uh, or pockets of methane. But um, the idea is to be able to free up that methane so that it can come out. You have to crack the rock to allow it to come out. And so here you see shallow aquifer, deep aquifer. This is all happening for the most part below the aquifers. And um, it's pretty intense, but you, um, you put in this fluid and the fluid can be a proprietary mixture, meaning that the, the companies don't need to say what they're actually injecting. But it can lead to groundwater contamination, which is a big, big concern. And it can also lead to overdrafting of groundwater, which is used for the fracturing process. In arid areas, there usually isn't such a surplus of water to use in that way. And you can get migration of the fracturing chemicals to the surface. It's very controversial. In 2011, the U.S. House of Representatives investigated a report on the chemicals used in hydraulic fracturing. It states that out of 2,500 hydraulic fracturing products, more than 650 of these products contain chemicals that are known or possible human carcinogens regulated under the Safe Drinking Water Act or listed as hazardous air pollutants. In 2011, Pennsylvania governor banned fracking of the Marcellus Shale, and petitions are currently being collected to put a ban on fracking on the, no on the November ballot for Santa Barbara County. So your parents will be voting on that. The third type is methane hydrate, trippy stuff, frozen, um, it's, it's ice with methane frozen inside. And we see this underneath the sea, sea so along the seafloor in Arctic areas. Um, it's also present in permafrost. So methane hydrate. So the hydrate means the water part, and that's the ice, but it has, con it has pockets of methane. Um, and uh, the big thing is if we get um, ocean water or ocean temperatures rising to the point that this methane hydrate begins to melt, that's going to release a lot of methane into the atmosphere, which we know that methane is a greenhouse gas. So it's going to cause more global warming, causing more rising of the ocean temperature, causing more methane hydrate to melt, causing more release of methane, etc., in a positive or negative feedback loop. I hope you, under I hope you recognize that that would be positive. So how can we reduce fossil fuel pollution? One is by using what we call emissions fees or green taxes. The more you pollute, the more you pay. So basically, it's a tax on companies and, um, and also consumers for doing um, polluting activities. There's a gas tax right now, and you know, we pay a lot of taxes when we buy gasoline, and those taxes go into certain things like maintaining roads, um, dealing with some pollution issues from the use of the gasoline. And companies are also being given credits for allowable pollution, and this is part of a, an approach called which one of these four? Okay, so if you said cap and trade emissions policy, that's correct. In this way, it's also called emissions trading. The government sets a limit or a cap on how much pollution is allowable for an entire industry. And then companies are issued credits or allowances for a certain amount of this allowable pollution. Companies that don't use all their credits can sell or trade them to companies that need more. And commonly, this is commonly used in the coal electric industry. So what are some mining terms? Um, here's a picture, by the way, just FYI of the largest hand dug excavation in the world, 800 feet deep, giving 600 pounds of diamond in South Africa. Here's an open pit copper mine in Utah, one of the largest excavations in the world, half a mile deep, two and a half miles wide. And here we see some leaching from a metal mine in Colorado. And uh, these are called tailings. They're piles of mining waste from removing the gang from the ore. The gang is like the, the rock that's not the special rock that you're looking for, which you have to separate from the special rock, the ore. 
and the white streaks are minerals leached from the tailings, causing soil and water pollution. So that's a, <clears throat> that's a big thing. When there's runoff, the runoff picks up minerals or metals from the tailings, and then uh, it runs off, and it can contaminate soil and nearby waterways. And the whole process there starts with mining of the ore, and then we um, process the ore, we remove the gang, um, and then we melt the ore, take out the metal part of it, put it in the cast, polish it up, and boom, shop. So um, mine reclamation is required by the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act of 1977. It helps to reduce acid mine drainage and helps to restore habitat. So this is Butchart Gardens in Canada, once a limestone, limestone rock quarry, now a beautiful garden that prevents acid mine drainage. And a little refresher on acid mine drainage, it is water that contacts abandoned mines becomes acidic as it reacts with sulfur in the exposed rock. And this is a major problem associated with mining. It can be reduced by neutralizing the acid with the base, such as lime, or covering the abandoned mine with new dirt. Okay. Um, oh, by the way, yes, the yellow iron precipitates are in a stream receiving acid drainage from surface coal mining.